Silence, please. And then we can begin this session. I'd like to um, open the panel by acknowledging those who are not here and whose voices are not on this panel. In fact, whose voices uh, have not been at any of the uh, events at the Commission of Inquiry. I'd like to acknowledge the people who have survived the deceased miners, and I'd like to acknowledge the people who continue to battle a revolution that is still underway. And it is largely the women and mine affected communities of the Marikama massacre that remain both unheard and underserved. Our panel tonight, um, we have from my left, my far left, Ronnie Castrols, former Minister of Intelligence, in the ANC government, post apartheid. <laughs> Mr. Castrols is also one of the few uh, members of the South African Jewish community to take a public stand against the activities in Israel. <laughs> Advocate Demise Tibetse AC who is the advocate and legal representative for the families of the deceased minors and also a former um, key member of the South African Truth, Commission, uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. <laughs> advocate Stuart Wilson who is the director of the Social Economic Rights Institute and also the representative of the families of the deceased minors. And Ms. Janet Love, who is the director of the Legal Resources Center, which is the representative of families of the deceased minors and of Benchmarks Foundation before the Marikan Commission Inquiry. And uh, Ms. Love is also, if I may, the only member of the South African Human Rights Commission who knows how to uh, fire and arm an AK-47 because of the role she played in the armed struggle against apartheid. <laughs> My name is Bonnie Myersfeld, I'm the director of the Centre for Applied Legal Studies. I'd like to... I'd like to ask each panellist to give a minute or two's worth of reflection on what we've just seen and what it means to them. And then I'd really like to open up to some of the colleagues and comrades who are in the audience uh, and maybe those who would like to to have a voice in a, in a context in which there have been too few voices heard about something that affects far too many of us. Uh, Ronnie, can I hand over to you for a few minutes? Thanks. Thanks. Well, I'm sure like everybody here, um, we're all incredibly... <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> I'm sure like all of you, we're incredibly moved by this fantastically powerful film a film that really shows what happened on that dreadful day and the events leading up to it. And you see on the film, and you'll remember from the police statements backed up by President Zuma and everybody else immediately afterwards, 
This was supposed to have been the police firing in self-defense. And all we saw on that day was the camera from the police lines and the miners apparently charging the police, which was the story what went out, that went out. And what Riha Desai has done is to really expose the premeditated murder that took place that day and the executions that Maranovich, Greg Maranovich, refers to because he was a journalist who went and sought for the facts behind the big copy where the other 17 people, 17 miners, were absolutely butchered. I came into the struggle like a lot of South Africans in 1960 with the Sharpeville massacre that shook us. And this was Sharpeville, the killing of peaceful protesters, the police within a police station, and clearly firing at the crowd because of their racist brainwashing, but in terms of actually being surrounded as they felt they were. They weren't under direct threat, but they opened fire. There was no premeditation. What happened at Marikana for me is far worse because it was absolutely premeditated. And we can see, and these are the questions we have to ask, whatever happens with the Commission, because commissions go on and on and on. They don't make the front pages of the press anymore. And that is where real responsibility lies. Now, obviously, it lies with the mining system in this country. It lies with capitalist exploitation. But we mustn't let those with political power, from the president to his security ministers, down to those foot soldiers, get away with the murder that took place to protect the wealth and the exploitation of the mining wealth of this country, um, which has happened over and over again for 120 years. And unfortunately, the movement and the government to which I belonged are the guilty ones, just as young smuts was in shooting down miners and, and the apartheid system for so many years and it's absolutely deplorable and we really have to do something to stop this rot. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I wish I could say the same things that Ronnie is saying, um, perhaps even with more force than he does because I'm, I'm involved. But the tricky position in which I am is that when the film was made, the anticipation was that by today, when we do this premiere of the film, the commission will be able to over, and um, it will place people like us who are still representing uh, victims at the commission in a, in a cleft stick position because that's where I am at, uh, as of now. In fact, there's, there's something in the film that remarks about how for over an hour after the shootings, the ambulances and those who had to provide emergency medical services were prevented from getting into the so-called crime scene. And um, as you will know, uh, from what you gather from the media. Uh, there is a General Naidu who was in charge of the EMS, uh, medical, uh, Emergency Medical Services, and um, who is now under cross-examination. In fact, on instructions from SERI, I am due to cross-examine him in the course of either this week or in the course of next week. So there is a, a relative amount of constraint with which I will participate in this panel. But what Ronnie has said is precisely a position that we took right from the beginning. Uh, from the beginning we posited the position that uh, the, the killings uh, 
to use Bonan language, uh, I know what I would like to call them, but the killings uh, were at the very minimum could have been foreseen. Uh, in fact, uh, and I can talk about this because uh, Jerem Pembe, whom you saw in the film, uh, came and testified and in the course of our cross-examination of him, we revealed that there was a footage in which he, the president of NUM, Mrs. Wakwana, and uh, Mr. Mukwena, representing Lonmin, were at a meeting the night before in which Jerem Pembe said he would like the president of NUM to give them the list of names and addresses of the mine workers so that they can uh, go and arrest them at their places of abode. But he had a point, <clears throat> which, is, which was the subject of our cross-examination of him. He said, listen, there is no way you are going to, in their language, you are going to arrest 3,000 to 4,000 people and try to disarm them. In his own words, there will be a bloodbath. You can't attempt to arrest and disarm that number of people. So the best way to do, if you want to disarm them, actually go to where they stay and where they sleep, surround the place, surprise them, remove their weapons. He says that the night before. So it was, it was something that uh, quite clearly uh, provided, I think, a basis for us to say it was foreseeable. Uh, if there, were, there was any doubt in his own words, Jerome Pembe said, there was going to be bloodshed, and there was bloodshed. And of course, what Greg says about what happens in scene two is, um, is blood curdling. Because as he says, Again, this is something that I do with a great deal of restraint because um, I, I do not want to appear to be anticipating the findings of the commission. But I can only speak what I'm instructed by those who instruct me to appear on behalf of the families to say in view of the, of the evidence. We don't see what happened in scene two or copy three on, on film because it was not taken on film. Except that there is one instance where there is a footage of a person who says, I shot the motherfucker ten times. So, how that would be consistent with a, a plea of self-defense, as the, as the Commissioner of Police was saying, uh, and how that kind of action uh, can be hailed, as she did, as being the most glowing evidence of uh, responsible policing defeats me, but then everything about the commission defeats me. Stuart. In the uh, days and weeks that followed the 16th of August 2012, my reaction, um, and I'm sure that of many others, was how can this happen? And how can this happen in a democracy? And how can it happen in this democracy? If, if anyone should know um, what the consequences of uh, an overarmed state oppressing the majority of its citizens are, if, ever, if, if anybody should know um, how ugly um, and violent and morally unrepeatable that should be, it should be us. And yet here we are, almost 20 years into democracy, trying to make sense of the state using the police to crush what would have been a substantially peaceful strike without uh, the involvement of the police. And we wanted explanations that didn't involve the failure of democracy. We wanted explanations that didn't involve the police becoming a paramilitary force in our society at the disposal of capital and a few political elites. And for many months after the end of the, of the massacre, we, we sought those explanations, we tried to, we tried to, we sought those alternative explanations, we tried to kid ourselves. 
um, and the failure of the Commission to get to work um, uh, 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 quickly and, uh, uh, and to focus on the right issues uh, early on uh, aided that. Uh, and in this in this mass of of, of, of no information and in this mass of, of of not wanting to face up uh, to and understand what had really happened, um, we have a great deal to thank Rahab Desai and Greg Morinovich for because they came in and um, where. Quite frankly, the state had failed, the police's internal structures had failed, the commission for a very long time failed to tell the truth about Marikana. Uh, Greg Moranovic succeeded, and, and as we've seen now, we, we sit um, well over a year after the end of the, the, the commission, and Rahab Desai has made a, a superb film uh, about, uh, about, about what really happened. The take home point from the film to me. Um, uh, apart from all, the, all of the other things that Demisa and, and Ronnie have said, is that we are facing um, a frighteningly unaccountable, highly militarized police force in this country, which is in the control of a very few people whose interests do not represent the vast majority of South Africans. And if you're going to... And if you want something, it's a harrowing film, it's a dreadful, in many ways a dreadful film. It's a well-made film, but it's a dreadful film. And if you want to take away from this film action, something that can, uh, that, that, that can make, try and make things better, uh, as South Africans uh, and as our friends abroad in this room, take away that, hold, your police off, uh, hold the police force accountable, hold the people who, who run the police force accountable. Um, get beyond the massive and pervasive fear of crime in this country, which has uh, in many ways silenced uh, criticism of the police for so long, and understand where that has got us. It's got us at the mercy of a state within a state, a militarized, unaccountable police force, and we need to start tackling that now. I, like the others, I sort of feel a bit shattered by the, by the film only because the um, seeing again of the images is, is incredibly, not just disturbing, but it's quite an emotional thing, I think, for all of us. Um, I know that uh, people at this table who participated in a struggle for democracy didn't participate to have a police force that was a police force against the people. And that's effectively what we saw. We saw a police force that didn't cast its role as being an agency of the people. We saw it cast its role as being an agency for power. And I think that that's where we get to having no one to blame. And that's the kind of chorus line that we saw at the beginning of the movie. No one to blame. And no one was to blame for so many things of apartheid, apparently. And we can't perpetuate and we can't allow that kind of, as Stuart has said, lack of accountability, but also that kind of masquerade of anonymity the number of coincidences of cameras and recording devices that just for those particular minutes didn't work is just too coincidental, really. And we need as a country, I think, to be able to assert accountability at all levels, accountability of our state and accountability of all those who hold power, but no more so than the accountability of our police to be police of the people. And so I suppose that that's a key issue that comes through every moment of this film. What maybe comes through in very small fragments is the fact that the holders of power in many senses remain intact. 
and somehow we need to, as a country, look at that again. Look at how the disparity and the, the growth of inequality can be allowed to continue. There are so many things that have not yet, uh, stories that have not yet begun to be told about the miners who are still at Marikana, but also miners who are everywhere. Many of these people, at the end of the month, the amount of money they take home after all of the various deductions have been made from their salary is less than 500 rand. Now, there's an iniquity there. There's an iniquity that we have to stop. Um, and it seems to me that there's that part of the story when you're dealing with a part of the continent that was identified as the fastest growing urban centre, Rustenburg, the fastest growing urban centre on the African continent. And the only reason for that is platinum. And yet within so much of such a context of so much wealth, you have such abject poverty. There's something wrong. And we really need to engage those sets of issues as well. So, I mean, the film, I think, leaves me um, with uh, the sense of something that I think we did all know, that uh, the struggle for democracy is not a struggle that has ended, and that the struggle is certainly not an easy one. But we need to be able to re-examine these questions and we need to really hold people to account in every way. There is somebody to blame. There are a number of people to blame. And we certainly can't blame, place the onus of responsibility on those who have the least, who are defending just their right to live with dignity. And after all, that's what we're supposed to have fought for. There is a, an entity in all of this that has in fact also remained quite silent and has not been asked to play a very functional role, notwithstanding its uh, fundamental liability for what happened at Marikana. And that entity is Laman. And that is also the elephant in the room. Why were people having to strike for the shameful amount of 12.5? Why were people having to ask for a meeting and being told that that action was illegal? What was the share price of London before Marikana? What was the share price of, Mar of London after Marikana? And what is the share price of London now? Its valuation on the London Stock Exchange has not changed. It remains the same and on the London Stock Exchange and on the South African Stock Exchange. It is, continues to be listed on our socially responsible index. The reality in lawyering around Marikana is that the type of lawyering we have to consider goes beyond a commission of inquiry into what the police did, which has taken over a year to even begin to understand. And what the Commission of Inquiry will do in respect of London will be roughly two to four weeks of a researcher taken from a low-level position in a research institute to tell us, other people, about what happens to migrant workers without ever asking a migrant worker themselves. This is not justice. And unless we are able to ask those very difficult questions about how many of us are still invested in London, I think that we're going to continue to look at commission inquiries for police killing and police brutality. Yeah, <coughs> I think that the... <laughs> I think the, there's a lot of 
introspection that we all need to have. And especially we who are sophisticated, um, who, who understand. We, we all understand what is at play. We, we do not need to do a great deal of research just from our own uh, uh, understanding of the, of the forces that are at play. We do understand and we understand very clearly. But whereas before 1994, um, we had a community of interest. The elephant in the room was this apartheid monster. Even if we were fighting it from various positions, there were those of us who were fighting it purely because it was speaking to, to that naked racism. And there were those of us, of course, who, who looked at it as not only apartheid, but as apartheid capitalism. Um, and those voices became muted post 1994. We're all too glad to have been political power. And that was the sad story about the TRC, in which I was involved. And that is, whereas the TRC concentrated on promoting reconciliation between uh, <laughs> the perpetrators and the victims, the blood and guts, uh, it didn't and could not, in the way in which the legislation was framed, address reconciliation between the haves and the have-nots, the rich and the, and the poor. And as a consequence, we, we had this perpetuation of a view that all that was troubling South African society was the difference between the races. And I think now, 20 years into our democracy, the real issue has come to affect us. It has actually come to express itself in these kinds of images that we saw in this film. Because who at the end of the day is at the receiving end? In fact, you could see that most of the police who were involved in the killings were black. Police there. Killing black mine workers. And therefore, I think there is a need for all of us to say, was, are we, in fact, in this day and age, are we to be fixated about the differences between us on the basis of race? Or should we grapple with the real issue? And the real issue is this huge Gini coefficient. The most unequal society in the world is the South African society, between the rich and the poor. Of course, there's a quarter of black capitalists who have come. That, that is why, I mean, React in the film continues to show the progression of Comrade Seven from the time that he was an activist in the Union to the time that he is now in the Board of Lonely. But about Tunisia and all his involvement in these uh, multinational organizations, isn't it time for us to do an honest introspection and decide for ourselves before it gets too late where we want to be? Something like what Amika Kapral said about the petty Mirazi, those of us who are actually able, because of our positions, to understand the progression of history, to start committing class suicide and align ourselves with those who should, in fact, be the carriers of, you know, real change. There isn't going to be a way in this country where we, the few, are going to want to reap the fruits of real freedom, particularly economic freedom, if it is not going to be spread around and it should go to the majority of the people, the working people, the poor. Uh, we'd like to open it up to the audience. So, um, 
the norm is to take three questions. So one I saw right up here. Um, I'm just going to go middle side side. So is there someone on that side who needs a question? Can't see anybody. Put your hand up. Put your hand up. Somebody. Anyone? All right. On this side. Uh, there's um, yeah, lady over here just find the cameraman, and then we'll uh, take some more after that. Yes. Um, my name is um, Harry. I'm Harry Rocket from the Philippines. Um, I was particularly moved by this uh, film because in the Philippines we're also prosecuting perpetrators of the Maguindanao massacre that claimed the lives of 58 individuals, including 32 journalists. I could say initially that I guess one, I don't know if you can call it advantage, but one thing that went for our prosecution is that it was a single deadliest attack against journalists, and when you do that against journalists, journalists worldwide will condemn it, and that is why I think more people know about the Maguindanao Massacre than the massacre that we saw now. First, I would like to volunteer to bring this film to the Philippines and show it to as many people as I can. But my question is to, my, to our colleagues on stage, we have parallels between our massacre and your massacre. But I guess one stark difference is even if the perpetrators of our massacre were like your mining company, very close to the powers that be, we managed to charge them four months after the massacre and made sure that some of them would be in jail. And they are still in jail even if they haven't been found guilty. We managed also to sue even the president for civil damages for aiding and abetting for this massacre. And we sued the policemen who were present administratively and civilly as well. We have not succeeded in any of these efforts, but I can assure you, not one of them responsible for the massacre has had a good night's sleep. My question to my distinguished colleagues is two years later, why have you allowed this SOBs a good night's sleep? Shouldn't you be doing something independent of the inquiry? It is a general principle of law that when they act with fault or negligence, they could at least be held liable for damages, or at least administratively. Why is it that it seems that all legal remedies revolve around an inquiry, and the sense that I get from the panelists is there's not much confidence in the inquiry. My question to all the South Africans, on the other hand, is what on earth happened to the ANC? And why haven't you booted out your leadership? This lady at the back, please, on the yeah. So, I think it's an incredible film. And I'm really, perhaps not as, I'm extremely angry. And the more I watch the film, the angrier I become. So also to the panelists, to Ronnie, to Misa and others, I think it's great comments that you made. I have three um, points. The first is that there is a pattern that you see in the Longman, the, the film here, the Maritana film, where the police are the strike breakers. Bosses no longer have to negotiate, no longer have to face workers in the unions. We saw the same in the farm workers strike here in the Western Cape. Not one farmer came out to negotiate with a farm worker. Not one farmer came out to negotiate were the unions. It was the police that we had to confront. And I think this is an, a real blight in our democracy. Everyone talks about this constitution that we have, and yet we do not have anyone that says when there is a legal, when there's a protected strike, not even legal, when there's a protected strike, the longman bosses should be facing the workers. They should be negotiating. It is their obligation. Why should the police 
We should be doing all other manner of criminal, uh, fighting crime in our communities. We never see so many, so many policemen going into Mannenberg. No. Because police in this country don't have to protect the working class. We see clearly on whose side they are. And I think these are the issues that we must take up. I also cannot understand, and I'd like to ask uh, Seri, Dumisa, Janet, and the chairperson, I, why is it that we cannot lay charges against the police commissioner? Why we cannot lay charges against the minister of police? All these others, not one of them have bothered with one explanation. It's a disgrace. It's an absolute disgrace. And I can't understand that South Africans who have this proud history of struggle can accept this level of complete intransigence upon the street. So you'd like a question before I hand over. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Joey, and uh, I'm coming from the northwest, where the actual damage has been happening. Um, first, let me say, um, about two weeks ago, the uh, chairperson of the ANC in the northwest uh, visited Marikana, and I think four days from there, during the week, uh, And then four weeks down, four days down the line, there was a chairperson of AMCU that was arrested because of a gun and, and, and something like that. Uh, we did ask ourselves why now, after the ANC has visited uh, Rustenburg to address the people, and the same week, someone from AMCU is being arrested. We'll come to that one. My learned friend from overseas, I'm a South African, I'm an activist, I'm highly active in my domestic politics. We do not sit here with blind eyes. We see what is happening. With creative industry and the excellent filming of this nature in South Africa. I want to appeal to the panels there and to whoever that is in charge for this film in South Africa. You must triple the speed of this film before the 7th of May, everyone will see it. Demisa, do you want to take a first shot at responding? No pun intended. Yes. Um, I think, I, I mean, my thing certainly is going to be that it's just as well that we have got this gathering of people here because I think we should take the blame. Every single one of us here belongs to one civil society organization or another. And all of us have been seeing this build up to what happened on the 16th of August. I mean, we saw the murder of Andre Stantani on Fulham. One minute he was shot to death and he died in front of our eyes. Did we do anything? It was again the poor in what we have now come to regard as the so-called civil uh, society, whatever you call it, is uh, the protest that bear the brand and all we do is to say people must protest peacefully. They must not destroy things and all of that. We may well be right at a sort of cerebral level. That is what people should not be doing. In fact, I'm not about to advocate that people should, should do what they are doing. But when we see these things happening on a daily basis, what is our duty as those who understand how society works? We see, uh, and we get to hear how our police 
service. And this is what we are interrogating in the Marigana Commission of Inquiry. Why shouldn't the police service enter into rules of engagement with those who are protesting to say, we are going to get into rules of engagement about how we should assist you to engage in peaceful protest. For instance, one of the most fundamental questions that have been asked and will continue to be asked by us for the remainder of the commission was why was it necessary that it should have ended on that day? What was so magical about the 16th year had to happen on that day? And we put the question, what was wrong in saying to the mine workers, listen, if you want to sit on this mountain for the remainder of the period, we are going to assist you. Sit here, engage in peaceful protests, let's have rules. You know, there have been killings up to this point, but let's not have any more killings. So that the police service will understand that their function in society is to assist a democracy in giving the people the rights which they have. And one of the rights that people have is the right to protest. Now, civil society, therefore, must carry the blame for Marikana. We tended to look the other way when Andrew Statani happened. When university students get beaten up by the police who come and break up their parties and get to know them, nobody paid any attention, not any one of us, either in organizations or as individuals, very few of us did anything about it. So this is a nasty wake-up call that it should have cost 34 people. If this film is going to be worth anything, it should be to the extent that it troubles us that these things happen and in our name. Because it is, they are happening in the name of our democracy. The National Police Commission says they were protecting themselves. They will say they were protecting our society to make it safer, a safer place to be. But I don't think that is so. Thanks to me, With sir. regards to civil, the, well, there's, there's, there was a mention about civil action and all of that. Why haven't we done that? All I can say to you, Mesia, and the chairman from Filipino, Watch this piece. <laughs> Janet. Um, I, a couple of comments rather than, um, I, you know, I think it's more of an exchange. But first of all, I think it's really um, the question of, the, of um, how we um, as organizations that see um, legal impact and um, carrying on casework in a way that attempts to make the law more meaningful for the kind of clients that we represent. I don't think any of us see what we do as being some sort of panacea or even some key issue. There's got to be, as Jamisa has said, you know, the whole, the rest of the toolbox. There's got to be the kind of activism, and there's got to be the kind of mobilization, there's got to be more of this sort of film to communicate with people, there's got to be more of a, of a searching for what are the right answers, not just what are the wrong answers. So I think that the, aside from watching the space, which has been said, um, I think that the reality is that we are in a phase of um, our, our country's development where the wake-up call is taking place and, and does need to be responded to in all of those ways. Um, and what Mercia said about the farm workers and the fact that you've got situations where even in protected strikes, police act as strike breakers. 
I think the important thing is that there is a whole distortion of the notion of a strike. People still talk about illegal strikes. They're protected or they're unprotected. And if they're unprotected, it doesn't mean that they can't happen. It just means that people have taken a decision to, to put more at risk, probably because they've got nothing to lose. But the idea that you have illegal strikes, the idea that you have unregistered organizations that are for some reason spoken about by a woman who actually came into the trade union movement in an unregistered union, as if these are illegal organizations, it's an outrage that our constitution guarantees those rights and we've got to change that discourse. We can't be talking about um, the notion of a strike as if it's something that, you know, people haven't got that right to withdraw their labor. So I think that that's part of that communication aside from uh, things like this film. The last thing I just wanted to say is that when it comes to the police, I, you know, Yes, uh, I 100% agree. Andres Tatani, Mosia, we saw him being dragged by a car. It actually went viral, and we've done nothing. You've got Cato Manor, a crime unit that has been killing people, and nothing has happened. It's, it's beyond what the issue of our police we can't allow the arrogance that we saw in this film to continue. It's not what we can accept. And that means that we do have to hold people to account. We do have to know what is happening with police in this country. And it won't only be through the courts. It's got to be with people saying that to have police that are not people's police, is not acceptable. I'm going to take a few more questions and then I'll come to Ronnie and Stuart and then I think we have to, I don't know how we're doing on timing. Jane? Hello. One over here, one at the back, and then... No. I'm Kushanda Pesto from Mellenberg because it seems the chairperson can't see me. <laughs> um, I just want to say to the panelists, I think this far great work, although I'm traumatized all over again. Um, for me, being a child of the 80s and being part of, of activism since that time, it's the volcano erupting. There's a Marikana in every province, in every poor community, there's a Marikana. It's no new news. There's nothing new about it. But I want to say to this room and to the panelists, we must stop dividing our struggles. Mellenberg has started, and, and, and I've heard people saying nobody's doing nothing. We've been going into a struggle for two weeks now, taking back our streets, and the song say, Oz Han Takao Tot Yala Okao. It's not for Melenberg alone, but the whole of the Cape Flags, and the whole of Gauteng, and every province, that we must claim back what's ours. That is what must happen. That must be the song that must be sung on everybody's tongue. Otherwise, all our people is going to be killed down and mowed down like animals. That is our reality in the poor communities. Thank you. Thank you very much.